right. There we are in our little lovely room. There's a master bedroom suite here. Closets with full mirror doors. One partially naked child back there. Huh? We'll hide her. We'll spare her. She's gratefully dead. Here's uh, our huge bathroom. Taking it more room than we ever need. Here's our little hidden kitchen. Shh, don't tell anyone. It's all under here. And I'll push this back. Pretty fancy schmancy microwave in refrigerator. Amy, shall you take over the tour from there, please? This little don't good size room. Don't show. And with a little side view of the harbor. <laughs> Which we'll be out on later today. St. Mary's Church. That's where the Kennedys got married.
Frank, what are you doing? <laughs> All right, you gonna come out? Wait, wait, wait. Okay. The Selva Regina College. Here's the breakers. A bad view of the world. Outside looking in, wishing she's by this. Chautauqua next to Breakers. Their kids way off in the boondocks. On their way. Their cliff walk. Whoa, what's this? Oh, silly. This Rosemont, a little private residence action here. Beachwood, they asked her. Yo, everybody, yo, get it from up here, yo. Woo! Yo, my man! From up here, you gotta get it. Oh! Oh! Get it out! Get it out! I ain't going. Terrific! I ain't going. Ready? I'm ready. Watch this! Oh! <laughs> Astas, Astas Beachwood. Mr. Family and domestic servants. Uh, now, they are firmly entrenched in 1891. And just as we know nothing past uh, 1994, they know nothing past 1891. So there may be some questions that you will have that they simply can't answer for you. 
And they're not trying to be rude, it's just they don't know. Uh, so, if you do have a question they can't answer, just save it until you finish with your inspection and circle back around here and you can speak with me. I just happen to be clairvoyant, so I should <laughs> uh, For today's purposes, uh, you are all members of the 400. Uh, this was the first elite social registry, actually initiated by Venus Times herself. Her Manhattan ballroom could hold only 400 people. And initially she was uh, somewhat concerned about this because she thought she might be excluding some people whose affiliation might give some benefit to her. But her right-hand man, Ward McAllister, told her there were probably only 400 people worthy of her attention to begin with, so this was just as well. Uh, the reason you're here today is you're great friends with Dina Sasser. You've met her many times before at bowls and teas. She's probably been to your home for dinner several times. But because you have such busy social schedules, and the Mrs. Astor, as the queen of American society, certainly has a very busy social schedule, it just so happens you've never actually been to Beachwood Cottage before. Uh, do remember, this is only a simple summer cottage. Uh, the Mrs. Astor was only here six or eight weeks after the summer season. And during that time, she would run off to Boston and New York for events there. Uh, there was also another summer home in Tibley on Hudson. Uh, there was, uh, of course, the House of Majority on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. Uh, so it, it's not unusual that you've not been here to college before. You're coming to dinner tomorrow evening, and you're here today because you want to make a brief inspection, just so you'll be familiar with your surroundings. And actually, I need to, to amend who all of you are. Those of you over the age of 18 are members of 400. Those under the age of 18 are members of royalty. So we are especially happy to have you here with us today. Um, if you do have counter boxes with you, please do feel free to use them. Uh, although, if you do bump into uh, Jack Astor, the only son to be Mrs. Astor, keep a tight grip on them about him. He fancies himself a bit of an inventor. He likes to take things apart and put them back together again. Unfortunately, he's only mastered the first part. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we go with lots of good bits. Uh, and just a few other little things that you want to know. If you want to take a character on yourself, please do feel free to. The people inside will talk to you with some familiarity. Uh, you may have even met some of them before a wedding or a ball or such things. Uh, Vanderbilts are not here yet, so you don't want to be a Vanderbilt. And you don't live in the break rooms because it's not been built yet. Uh, even the Marble House right next door is only being built just now. Uh, at this time, 1891 in Newport, uh, this was one of the larger side cottages at the time. All right, so please look at the Thank you. What, what was the guys stand for? It was played indoors with a hard ball and a small racket. By the 1400s, the game had become so popular that it was banned in Paris, Holland, and England because players were neglecting their families and jobs. Here at Newport, court shots would still be played at one of the few remaining sites in the United States. But to take tennis outdoors, Required to enter among the growing leisure class. People were looking for a game to bring the men and women together, a courtship game on the court, if you will. And there was croquet, but not quite as vigorous as some would like. Tennis was a natural. To tennis history. Back in 1881, the first national championships were held here, pitting Richard Sears against James Dwight. It was the society event of the season, and everyone who was anyone turned out in straw hats and gowns. The origins of tennis reach back at least 600 years to the courts of European royalty. It was played indoors with a hard ball and a small racket. By the 1400s, the game had become so popular that it was banned in Paris, Holland, and England because players were neglecting their families and jobs. Here at Newport, court tennis can still be played at one of the few remaining sites in the United States. 
but to take tennis outdoors require two inventions, the rubber ball and the lawnmower. In 1873, a British Army major, Walter Clopton Wingfield, patented the new game of lawn tennis he called Sparistiki. The game spread like wildfire among the growing leisure class. People were looking for a game to bring men and women together, a courtship game on a court, if you will. And there was croquet, but not quite as vigorous as some would like. Tennis was a natural. Brent, nice spill. Oh, cute. Good spill. Nice spills. I got a lot of film, Pete. It's pretty good. It's running. Hey, mate. Megan, Surat. Go for it. Oh my gosh, it's moving. What a guy. Moose.
separated from uh, the iron. Uh, this would kind of bend in a, in a, uh, a right angle uh, configuration. Um, and the whale at that point would be towing your boat over the water. You got 1,800 feet of line you can tie on here, so you're skimming over the water in a boat this size, six people in the boat. 
at some point the whale will tire. Whales are mammals, they, they can dive, sperm whales can dive up to a mile or so, but eventually have to come up for air. When they came back up, or when they were lying docilely on the surface, then you would bring your boat over to the whale. The harpooner's job was done. His job was to get the harpoon into the whale. The mate, there was one reason why you have so many mates on a vessel like this is because each boat has to have an officer. Five boats, five officers. It's the mate's job to come forward and to kill the whale with a lance. The lance was driven into the flank of the whale or sometimes behind the blowhole. You're trying to puncture the lungs or puncture the vessels feeding or, or bringing blood away from the lungs. Uh, and so this was driven into the back or the side of the whale. You had to be on top of the whale to do it, literally. They called it cedar, which is the what the bottom of the boat is made of, cedar to skin, like the black skin. Uh, so you're actually coming up onto the whale. This is being thrust in, churned, pulled out, thrust in again. Once the, 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 the mate has jabbed out into the whale, so he's assured that he's hit uh, organs, uh, lungs, the whale will begin to spout blood through its blowhole. Whalemen call that chimneys of fire. It was a fairly sure and significant sign that the whale had been mortally wounded. Then you would row for your lives in reverse to get off the whale because the whale at that point would go into its death throes, reaching out of the water, just going berserk, dying, um, and you didn't want to be around it because the whale was many times twice as big as your 30 foot boat. It would lose its equilibrium and, and try swimming off and then swim in a circle and finally die. And when it died, it would kind of roll over on its side and put a fin up in the air. These guys would roll back over to it, poke it in the eye with a lance to make sure it was dead. And then they'd roll it back to the ship. You could row between half a mile and a mile an hour with a whale in tow. You'd cut the tail off. So you'd decrease that, that the lateral resistance, cut the tail off, throw it back to the ship, flash it along this side. Once it's secure along this side, this platform here, this is a cutting stage, would be lowered on top of the whale, right over the whale. Not touching it, but about 10 feet or so above it. And then the officers, because this was a skilled job of cutting in, there's some spades here that are about 16 feet long. The officers would begin to strip the blubber from the whale in a spiral dash from head to tail. And once they began that spiral, they could almost uh, in perpetual motion, uh, getting the whale spinning, you could almost peel it, you could peel it off quite easily. So these guys are out there cutting slices, what's known as scarfing. Here's the slice, peel that slice back, and it's peeling off like this. They're bringing up slabs of blubber, which weigh between three and four tons, with a big hook. A lock and hat system that leads back to the winch. The same winch that makes the anchor up, they're bringing the blubber up. So they're bringing on slabs before they're cut here that are about 16 feet long by four to six feet wide. That the slab is lowered into the next area called the tween deck. It's the blubber room. And that's where they're cutting that big piece into the blocks. The blocks are about this size. They're called horse pieces. Every block has to come back up here, be pitched back up here. Go over to this mincing station, this mincing horse here. And that double-handled knife, the, the block is set on that, uh, that wooden bed right there. That double-handled knife is employed, so you're cutting not all the way through. You want one piece. You're opening up a lot of surface area like you would with French bread or Italian bread to expose more surface because the next station, of course, is to be cooked in the tripods, 250-gallon pots in that 24,000-pound furnace. And uh, there's a fire started with uh, cordwood, and then the scrap of this process is used to fuel it. And you're just melting blubber down.
bailing it out into a proper cooling tank, taking on more blubber, melting that down, bailing it out, cooling it, putting it in large casks like these we have. Those casks uh, are eventually uh, put down below. The many times large casks were built and you would use canvas leather, canvas or leather hoses to gravity feed the oil down there. Process goes on and on and on. You, again, you need some 50, 60, 70 whales to fill this ship up. Which took how long? Two to five years. Two to five? Sounds like a, sounds like a prison sentence, doesn't it? And the longest voyage of this vessel is 59 months, obviously. Take a float as you and the partners were parting the better ones. Sometimes they yell out five and forty more. Another so way. If they sent the five boats out, what if they spirit two or three whales, would they ever be that lucky or not? Sometimes a couple. Oh. That's Where the mothership is. So each whale boat had a compass in it. We took her a heading, a reading. Try and remember where the mothership was. Your job was to get back by nightfall. This was a daytime job. If you were still in tow, five miles out, and if night were to, uh, shades of night were to come on, then you would set up a, uh, a lantern system. You'd take a lantern up there. You had a lantern keg with a lantern and striking material and some little bit of food and water in the boat so you could make that contact. So where do I find my children? <laughs> At the Brent feeling a pinch of guilt, as is his mother, hollering as she repents, as well she should after her revelations last night. Sailors got. And there were people on shore who knew that. 
Sailors called those people land sharks because they were there to devour the sailors' pay as quickly as possible and give them as little as possible in return. And sailors would spend their money, the, uh, the saying was that they worked like donkeys at sea and spent their monies like asses ashore. <laughs> and by golly, when they were, were out of money, just a couple of weeks sometimes after a year and a half voyage, you'd think the land sharks would be done with them, but they weren't. When a sailor signed on board his next ship, he was entitled to get his first month's pay in advance. The idea of that was that when he came on board, he needed to have all his equipment, his sea boats, his foul weather gear, rigging knife, his bedding and his plate and spoon and cup for, for eating with, all that, he had to supply himself. So if he got a month's pay in advance, he could, he could afford to buy that, even after he'd blown all his money on shore. But there was a kind of land shark that had his eye on that money, too number of men and their outfits, and you give me the month's advance. And by the mid-19th century, in many ports, it was impossible for a captain to get a crew without going through a crimp. So that when the sailors got up on the first morning on board ship, they knew they were going to be working for a month for money that they would never see. It had already gone into the pocket of the crimp. And they called that working off the dead horse. It was as though you bought a horse, and when you went to pick it up, it was dead. Too bad, it's still your horse. And that, of course, did not make them particularly happy. It made, in fact, it made them feel kind of bitter. So at, towards the end of the month, what they'd do is they'd make one of these things, an effigy of a horse. And on the very last day of that first month at sea, they'd conduct a ceremony that was designed to let them blow off all those bitter feelings. They'd bring this thing up on deck, and the captain would get a knock on his door and say, Dead horse on board, sir! And everybody come on deck, and they take this thing, and they drag it around deck and punish it for making them work for a month for nothing. This gets all the blame. <laughs> so they kick it and spit on it and beat it and sing an abusive song about it and hang it from the yard arm, which is the tip of the yard. And then to top the ceremony off, they cut it off and let it fall into the sea. And the moment it hit the water, was the moment that the crew considered that we're starting to get paid now. And if the captain had a good sense of shipboard politics, what well, he'd say, all hands, splice the main brace. And it means everybody gets a drink. And that could cement good feelings for some time. So what we need to do this ceremony to reenact it is, first of all, a crew. Print. Print. Anybody else want to help? Come on up and pick him up. Good. OK, well, we'll drag him back here. And they'll start forward, and you all follow us right on up, and we'll uh, finish the thing off up there. You ready? Ready. <laughs> a poor old man came riding by, and we say so, and we hope so. A poor old man came riding by. <laughs> poor old horse. I old man, your horse must die. And, and we, we say so, so, and we hope so. Says I, old man, your horse around, must around, die. Poor old horse. One month the help and flight we've led more. Poor old horse. Old horse, old horse, what brought you, you here? And we say so, and we hope so. Well, you cut it stone for many a year. Poor old horse. Or abuse. And we say so, and we hope so. <laughs> we'll swing you up for sailor's use. Or we'll hoist you up to the four-yard arm. And we say so, and we hope so. Way up, blow up, where you do no harm. Or we'll send you up and send you high. And we say so, and we hope so. And then for your sins you must die. Poor old horse, we'll cut you down on a long, long roll. And we say so, and we hope so. May the sharks have your body, and the devil take your soul. Poor old horse. Work well.
able to take them, and usually they floated. Occasionally they'll, they'd also take humpbacks um, and uh, gray whales and pilot whales. So it was important to know what kind. It was important to know how far off and how many and in what direction because the officer of the deck was going to order a number of whale boats lowered, usually at least two. The Morgan could lower as many as five. In this case, lower the, lower the bow boat. Two men were in that boat as it came down. The harpooner who was in this position, and the boat had her back aft. The rest of the men came down the falls. Now, you can see the harpooner has an oar. It's like um, four other men in the boat. So he indeed had to row, and therefore he faced aft towards the, the boat header, who was really the only man who could see the whale when they were approaching it. So it was the boat header that actually told the harpooner when to do his job. The most commonly used directions for that was Stand up and give it to him. <laughs> of course, the whale didn't want to get what the harpooner had in store for him. Hey, we have a question here, and I'll, I'll address it right now, and then I'll ask for questions to be asked later. Why did they shoot the whale from the mother ship? Um, for one thing, when they started whaling, they didn't yet have whaling guns. And for another thing, the big ship is so unmaneuverable. She's very hard to turn around. Go very fast. A small boat like this, you could actually chase the whales in. So the hunting was done from a small boat. Get it? Um, so what they do is they'd approach that whale, and the harpooner would stand up to do his job, which was to stick the iron of the harpoon into the whale. This is a double flued iron. You see the very sharp end. It tended to cut its way out as well as going in very easily. It's, it pulled out and more whales than it stayed in. 48, a black New Bedford ship smith named Lewis Temple came up with another kind of iron. Got the idea actually from the elutes. Um, and it goes in and it toggles open and it stayed in much better than the old kind. The harpooner does get two chances to make good. He tries to get these irons all the way into the hitches where the metal joins the wood. If he can possibly get the second one in as well as the first, that's insurance. Two Two harpoons is better than one, but if he can't, uh, doesn't have a chance to get the second one in, he's got to toss it out of the boat because both are attached to the whale line. That line runs through the chocks here underneath this kicking strap that pisses it out forward of the boat, also um, lead, keeps it from uh, going up into this man's face. That line passes aft over all the oars, around a friction point in the stern from where it is controlled and into the two chocks not actually tied anywhere in the boat. Um, now, when a whale is struck by a harpoon, of course, it reacts. And um, whales are often depicted as reacting by biting the boats and or smashing with them with their tails or, or overturning them, and that certainly did happen. However, whales also might react by sounding or diving. If a whale did sound and there was another boat nearby, they'd add that other boat's 2,000 feet of line. It's about 2,000 feet of this line. That would give them 4,000 feet because sometimes, well, the men knew that whales could sound maybe up to a mile. And uh, so that would add uh, 2,000 feet. They had more chance of keeping that whale. Or if that whale was sounding pretty fast and they were about to lose their line, there was no other boat here. They'd attach this rope to it, or a drug as they called it. Just, it's just a bobber. It creates a drag. Hopefully the whale surfaces where they can find it, and it's much easier to find that drogue than to just find the end of the line. Water, and they didn't really want to become a submarine, so they used their crisis management tools here and sever the relationship. <laughs> but what happened frequently enough, and what they wanted to happen, was for the whale to feel the iron and to, to be frightened, to want to get away, and for the whale to take off, swimming away, pulling this boat behind it while the for the Merchant Marine Academy, which is similar to, to this. And the reason why these schools are so good is because the people who come out of it. Um, yeah, and they get checked in water and the Coast Guard will just flip over. Well, the Coast Guard does a lot with um, aliens, illegal aliens that are coming in. The Coast Guard does a lot with. Out of Florida? I mean, illegal aliens. Off to see the Nautilus. Yeah, what one man can imagine, another can achieve. 
Jules Verne, 10,000 leagues under the sea. He wrote that. 20,000. 20,000? How many leagues was it, Pete? 20,000. This ship resulted in a worldwide revolution submarine design. The Nautilus was the first ship to sail under nuclear power and the first ship to transit the North Pole. Hey Pete, going into the attack room.